Hi. I would hug you, but hi. <laughs> <laughs> you look amazing. I couldn't figure out what to wear. Oh, please. Also, I haven't worn a corset in probably eight months. You look incredible. It sounds funny, but I was like, I miss dressing up and having people stare at me. You don't start dressing like this because you want everyone to think you're acceptable. You know, I could be killed in half this country for walking down the street like this. The drag queen are grooming children to accept that lifestyle. I was the poorest kid in a small town with the worst family anyone's ever heard of. Whenever I get back on the billboard charts or when we had a best-selling book or when I won Drag Race, there's always these freeze frames of like, how did this happen? It's 11 a.m. in Hollywood and we're here with my diabetic mother having a tequila shot. Oh, cheers. Love you. You have so much going for you. I mean, how rich are you? <laughs> <laughs> how rich? Uh, by drag queen standards, extremely rich. <laughs> we are accidental role models because the ultimate move is to live for yourself and don't give a fuck. Trixie Mattel is the diva of all drag queens. She's a pink skinny legend of a bombshell in big wigs and bold lips. They must be actually partying out here. You hear that noise? Yeah, there's a farmer's market right outside. COVID-19 rages on, but the Caucasians of Los Angeles still need that farmer's market. <laughs> she shot to fame after competing in the hit TV show RuPaul's Drag Race, and now she's one of the most popular queens in America. She runs her own TV show, podcast, and makeup brand as well as selling three country music albums and a New York Times bestseller. And it's safe to say she's unlike anyone I've interviewed before. Well, Trixie, thank you so much for meeting with us and for doing this, especially in the middle of COVID. I'm so, so glad we get to I'm willing you. to die for this. <laughs> that makes not two of us. So many young people are also just so in love with you, your energy, your confidence. What does it feel like to be such an icon? Well, it's very, uh, let's say, modular icon status because the, the limo driver doesn't care who I am. The limo driver's granddaughter is crying. My friends are going to be so jealous. I hope Finally. they are. They Finally. really are. The amount of times I've been like, oh, I've got to go to Syria next week. I've got to go to, <laughs> go to Yemen <laughs> next week. And now I'm like, oh, I've got to go to LA next week, interview Tricks and Mattel. And they're like, what? I know. <laughs> Suddenly. You're in Syria, stressed out. This will be the interview that gets you canceled, too. Exactly. <laughs> Oh God. You'll end up on some like Facebook site, like she's a she's a homosexual enabler or whatever, you know. Oh God. I'm big with teens, girls, lesbians, the mentally ill, the very sad, folk music enthusiasts. Do you I enjoy like it? Do you enjoy being famous? I love being famous. I love it. I go to gay bars, I get noticed, and I'm like, stop. But inside I'm like, this is awesome. It's so refreshing to hear you say that because, you know, when you talk to a lot of successful people, they like to talk about, you know, the way they got successful, but then also, you know, how hard it is. I'm obsessed with it. I love it. But you have to think, it wasn't that long ago. I was lip syncing for 15 people in a burger bar. It took some time for Trixie to become Trixie. She was born and grew up as Brian Fergus. I want to go back a little bit. I mean, you grew up in a place called Silvercliff in Wisconsin. Yep, Silvercliff, Wisconsin. I'm not going to lie, I've never heard of it before reading up on you. Uh, I think it has a population of around 500 people. Yes, it does. Can you tell us what it was like growing up there? Well, I grew up on a dead end dirt road in a trailer. So far removed from everything. A hundred percent. I mean, how different did you feel back then? I was such a gay kid. I loved pink and glitter and dolls and but I knew enough about the environment to not say anything about it, you know? But I always wanted to be famous. I used to sit and practice drawing my name, like my autograph all the I time. I did that too. You did? Yeah. I would be in school and people would be like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm working on my autograph because I'm going to be a star. And people are like, okay, f And what was your relationship like with your family back then? Um, well, my mom and I have always been pretty close. She's like a super dry, sarcastic Native American you know, single mom, hippie woman. We're here with my diabetic mother having a tequila shot. Uh, cheers. Love you. Love you too. 
She's so funny. I just bought her a house in Wisconsin. That was cool. And that must have felt so good. It did. But then I told my realtor, now this could get really emotional. You know, she's never owned a house like this. She rents a trailer in the woods. You know, this could be a big day and she could, we could see some waterworks. I took that whore into my house and Alyssa said, look, this is your house. I bought it for you, cash. And she goes, it looked bigger in pictures. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Turns out you can be Wisconsin trash and have nothing and still be like bougie somehow. <laughs> That's hilarious. <gasps> oh my goodness. My brother, he was always worried that if I was a performer, I wouldn't make any money. Turns out the cure to that is make more money than he does. Mm. That's a great way to. What does he make of what you do now? Well, my brother's so impressive. He's like a three-time Iraq war vet. I read He's that. He's an attorney. He's amazing. He's like the perfect American man, like perfect. That and bastard. I'm the perfect American woman. <laughs> <laughs> In pursuit of that perfection, though, Brian struggled for acceptance. At a young age, his stepdad became physically and emotionally abusive, once pointing a loaded gun at him and saying he'd shoot. My stepdad growing up, he used to call me a Trixie whenever I was acting too feminine or too emotional. And so that's kind of how I got the name. You took it and ran Yeah, with and it? I just go by Trixie. It's weird because to me that was like a slur, that was like it or something. And now, Trixie in like American zeitgeist is like people think of me like the gayest person ever. I mean, how do you see those times impacting your life later and kind of what you chose to do, the path you chose to take? I can really laugh through anything. And honestly, like once I moved out, like every day of my life just felt great. I was the poorest kid in a small town with the worst family anyone's ever heard of. Whenever I get back on the billboard charts or when we had a best-selling book or when I won Drag Race, there's always these freeze frames of like, how did this happen? Do you remember the first time you put on drag? I bought like a pair of black heels, I think on Amazon, and I bought black fishnets. This was in Milwaukee? Yes. And I remember looking in like the full length mirror and then being like, I'm gonna be doing something like this. After moving to the bright lights of Milwaukee, at 18, Brian got a role as Dr. Frankenfurter in a college production of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It was his first foray into the world of drag, and he loved it. In drag, I feel like I could take this building down, you know, so... And did it feel like that the very first time you put drag on? Yes, like, unleash. Be disgusting, be filthy, be loud, be sexual, be aggressive. It was like all these parts of yourself that you've trained yourself to suppress are now a huge asset. And do you feel like you're able to get away with more because you're oh a my man God. dressed as a woman? You have to think out of drag, I'm a six foot tall Caucasian presenting guy with a shaved head. I look like a clan member. This is my license to kill. Drag itself is not a new phenomenon. Even as far back as plays in Greek amphitheaters, men were dressing up as women to entertain. As time went on, it became more about individuals with their own fan bases and evolved from theatres to underground balls and bars, sacred spaces where subcultures could thrive. For people who don't know what drag is or haven't been to a drag show or live on a different universe maybe, what is drag? A typical drag show is probably a, a bar or a club. The poster probably says 10 p.m. start time. It starts at 11.30 because everyone's running late. We do it all. We do the hair, we do the makeup, we make the costumes, we mix the music, we put together the choreography. Trixie's look is based around her ultimate inspiration, Barbie, the world's most recognized doll, the all-shiny, plastic-fantastic American dream. I love Barbie because it's like a snapshot of American history. You have to think every doll is a time capsule of what women looked like, dressed like, or what fashion was with Trixie, I designed her to be a caricature of Americanized feminine beauty. The biggest lips, big hips, big boobs, long hair, big lashes. But I like using Trixie to parody that stuff. Women especially look at Trixie and go, the expectation of women is crazy, and Trixie's such a good little joke on that. On the other hand, they look at me being hyper-feminine, and they're like, being a woman is fucking fierce. What is that statement that you're making? What is it that you're rebelling against? What is it you're pushing against in society? You don't start dressing like this because you want everyone to think you're acceptable. You know, 
I could be killed in half this country for walking down the street like this. You know, I, just, I got dropped off today and the driver was like, I'm gonna walk you in. Drag queens, no matter how successful you are, you are still this kind of scab on the underside of culture and you're proud of it. It's fun to be beautiful and a little disturbing. You know, Trixie is both a clown nose on what a woman is and like a, of what mm -hmm. a woman is, you know? It's kind of a feminist statement. I mean, do you feel like what you're doing helps to eradicate toxic masculinity? A hundred percent. And it's a pro gay boy statement. Like we're in a country where our idea of masculinity is commodified mm -hmm. and femininity is weakness. And drag plays with all of that because in drag, you're a man who dresses like a woman who becomes the most powerful person in the room. We are accidental role models because the ultimate move is to live for yourself and don't give a fuck. Thanks to RuPaul's Drag Race, today drag is more popular than ever, exploding into our living rooms in all its glory and propelling unknown queens like Trixie into first-rate royalty. The champion of All Stars 3 is... Trixie Mattel. We've got all these shows out now. We've got RuPaul, we've got Legendary, we've got Pose. And drag has gone incredibly mainstream. Were you surprised at how, how it's turned into that? To me, drag's so cool because it's the only show where you can be offended to your skeleton and empowered like you could change the world. Your homophobic uncle, who has not a gay friend, might catch an episode of Drag Race, let's say, and have his whole world changed. I mean, on the face of it, it is incredibly empowering to see people who are kind of traditionally shunned by society. But do you think that, you know, the fact that drag has gone so mainstream means that we're becoming a more accepting society? Drag will never really be mainstream because we're still gross to a lot of people, you know? Why is it, do you think, that people find it gross? I think that most people, they think, when they think cross-dressing, they think it has to do with sex. And in America, at least, people are so afraid of sex and nudity and their bodies that anything that makes them think of sex makes them uncomfortable. What about people who just think it is plain wrong, that, you know, God made men men and women women and there shouldn't be any gender fluidity or...? Well, God's not real, and I am, so do that with that. People come to the drag shows for the feathers and the sequins, but what are we really inspired by? We're inspired by someone being themselves. That's, that's bottom line, what it is. Drag performers earn their keep with flamboyant impersonations, lip syncing, and comedy. Trixie also performs her own music. You introduced folk music into your performances. How difficult was that to kind of infuse what is like this very fun, extravagant Barbie doll with very kind of serious and quite honest and raw music that you choose to play. I think it's because it's like a chihuahua walking on hind legs or something, you know? Like drag queens are not supposed to be doing something so honest. Mm. And guitar playing and storytelling, a white guy with a guitar, not that hard to come by. But I've like being Trixie two. and doing stand up and playing guitar, it was like, oh, this is like, this is perfect. I'd love to hear a little bit of your music if you're willing to sure. play for us. Yeah. Is it easier to stand up or? Um, we'll just play some stuff. Nice. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> I wrote this at a time where I did not want to do drag. I was in drag all the time. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. I was doing like five shows a week and I was so over it. Who doesn't like love their job and then be like, I love my job, but I would rather die than go today. That's normal. Did you want to come here today, camera guy? Of course I did. <laughs> no, he fakes it. <laughs> okay, this song's about that. Mama, don't make me put on the dress again. I can't stand the way it opens when I spin. Ribbon bows around my shoulder and I'm only getting older. Mama, don't make me put on the dress again. I haven't sang this in a long time. I love this song. It's like song. some real country shit. It's so good. Daddy, don't make me fancy dance around. 
paint her up in that makeup like a clown. If I see another stocking lord, I swear to God I'm walking lord. Daddy don't make me fancy dance around. When I'm coming home alone for the hundredth time or so, it gets harder on my hard earned money's dying. To the bottle in my basket, will it answer if I ask it? Doing right or am I doing time? That's part of that. That was so good! I loved it! That was amazing. So when you're up on stage now, you're you're doing your standard drag show stuff, but you're also doing stand-up comedy, and you're also playing your own country folk music. I mean, what is it that you enjoy the most? What feels most authentically you? For me, I love doing stand-up. I love writing my music, I love playing guitar, I love singing, but I just love talking to the audience. Do you ever think that you've taken it too far? I mean, as you said, you know, you're there to be provocative in part, but at the same time, back in 2018, when you made a joke about slavery, that led to a big online pushback. Well, I think context matters because it's a roast. I mean, straight people on Comedy Central and a roast on television are telling the most homophobic, awful, racist, transphobic, Islamophobic roasts are the worst jokes you've ever heard. Was that a joke I would say in a normal show? Absolutely not. Wouldn't even think about it. Many people came to Trixie's defense, including the target of the joke, Latrice Royale, who Trixie still performs with. I guess, you know, that now the issue is you have so many millions of followers, especially young followers, and that is getting bigger and bigger. And so, you know, people would argue that perhaps your responsibility should be, you know, more targeted towards them. I mean, I definitely feel like a social responsibility, but as far as like embracing content that makes the audience feel like they can let their guard down and be a little over the line, you can laugh at jokes in a theater and not take it into the world with you. That's how I feel. Then again, I know that my sensibilities are like, I've probably never been offended by a joke. These days, everyone's so sensitive. I'm never sure just what to say. There's no jokes about blacks in my one woman act about the Mormon, the Jewish, or gay. I can make a gay joke. I have a gay friend. It's this bitch right here. Trixie, as always, refuses to take anything too seriously even through the pandemic, where she's been a quarantine machine, pumping out a 12-part streaming series with longtime collaborator Katya Zamolochikova, ahead of a fifth season of their YouTube show. And she's found time to settle down. You're in a long-term relationship with, um, with your partner, David. Yeah, we've been together like four years. Can you believe it? Which apparently is like 20 years for gay people because everyone's stunned. Any talk of kids? I mean, just how much we hate them. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> I just, I mean, sometimes I think about it. Like, not to be weird, one day I'll see a commercial with a kid and go like, I fucking hate that. And the next day, maybe it's 1 a.m. and I'm looking at profiles of children to adopt. So I'm very hot cold. Put that on the adoption papers. Yes. For now though, Trixie's focused on building her empire. With a revolving door of chart-topping singles, her expanding cosmetics business, and her upcoming tour. You have so much going for you. I mean. How rich are you? <laughs> <laughs> How rich? Uh, by drag queen standards, extremely rich. <laughs> but you have to think, 99% of drag queens are making a $40, $50, 60 show pay. You know, I worked in drag paycheck to paycheck, show to show, for much longer than I've been like comfortable. Do you ever feel like you lose touch with the real world or the world that we all live in? Sometimes I'm like, this is weird, you've taken this too far, you know. When, when do you feel like that? Sometimes I'm taking the worst, darkest parts of my life and talking about them in a way that makes the audience laugh and sometimes I'm like, I can't believe you just revealed that. It is interesting though that you use that comedy as a, a, a sense of therapy. Yeah, I mean, you take all the power out of it. Because I'm like a lobster too. To get to the good part, you have to crack me open. <laughs> the value of you doing this interview is you showing up in drag. Yeah. And I'm wondering if like that impacts you on the inside or just like you yourself and your sense of worth. Oh, like they don't want me unless I'm dressed up. Yeah. 
I'm a very confident person, but I'm largely like antisocial. So if I do go out, I'm not really the chattiest or the smiliest or even the friendliest. Versus, Apart from when you're in drag? Yeah, versus in drag, I feel like the party starts when I walk in. Do you want to be doing it in 20 years time? I do. I mean, at this point, it's like doing porn or something. Like, there's no turning back. These credits don't necessarily transfer. <laughs> what can I offer you? You know, a d joke and some backcombing? I can't really go take that resume down to the gap now, can I? <laughs> well, it must also be hard to give up because you get so much attention. Honestly, I'm not happier than I was doing drag for $40. I was, you know, paying my rent and doing drag locally, and I felt like I was a star. This goes, this goes here? Yeah, so that's a steel bone custom corset. Oh my gosh, this it's, looks so painful. Yeah, so this is my real body. I'm being vulnerable. The one thing about moving away from Wisconsin and moving to LA was the more like successful I got, the more I would come home and hear like people's opinions of me had changed. Somebody was like, oh yeah, she's a total goner, meaning like live in LA, sell out, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that just like stuck with me. So then I wrote this song called Goner. And I just, I love it and I haven't recorded it, but I just wanted to play it. I'd love to hear it. She's so hypnotizing, she's so funny. She's out here monetizing. Oh, honey, hi, guess I never really saw it coming. She got the game looking so stunning, hey, anyway. She got the key to the city today, hey, hey, there goes a parade. She's a goner now, puts on her crown and waves. Do -do -do -do, do -do 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 -do. That's just part of it. That was so nice. Thank you, I love it. When I'm coming home alone for the hundredth time or so, it gets harder on my heart and money's dying. To the bottle in my basket, will it answer if I ask it? Doing right or am I doing time? In beauty school, they said if you can't paint your nail in three strokes, you're doing it wrong. But I don't think those people had man hands, so. <laughs> Can I show you my attempt at painting my nails this morning? Sure. Oh, you've been doing How your own. How embarrassing is this? It's not your best work. No, this it's, is my best work. Oh, that's, that's what's embarrassing. Hey, everybody starts somewhere. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm meeting Trixie Mattel. I have to paint my nails. I love but. painting nails. When I was in beauty school, nobody wanted to do it, the pedicures and the manicures, but I loved it. Really? It takes yes. a lot of, it takes a really steady hand though. What's your, what's the key? I just have to find a window where I'm not drinking, mm. you know? <laughs> You worked at a makeup store for like five years, right? Yes, I did. I worked at like an Ulta, a Sephora, and a Mac at all different times. Wow. So I used That's to do- That's where those skills come from. Yeah. Well, also like uh, one of the stores I used to work at, you had to have your nails painted. So I would be like watching the clock like- Oh, wow. Yeah. Pretty much drag, you learn to do everything quickly because you have to do everything yourself. Yeah. I mean, How I- How long did it take you to get ready today? Like an hour and 15 minutes. That is- Quick. Yeah, For I'm really that fast. artistry, that is amazing. I've been doing it so long, I just like wow. turn it out. You know what I mean? No, I don't, but that looks amazing. Because I, I, don't I know feel how like you if I it. have three hours to get ready, you'll take three hours. I, yes. Yeah. If I have an hour, I take an hour. And I'm very into mini dresses with matching legs. Nice. With thigh cleavage. I've got a bit of thigh cleavage going yeah, on. Yeah, so. complex modesty. Oh, yeah. This is the new Love it. breast cleavage, just the thigh. Yeah. You know. Classy. Yeah. What about these tights that haven't been washed? This cadaver gray? What do you think about that? I love them. <laughs> cadaver gray. I think for a lot of people, you know, they see you doing exactly what you want to do and being exactly who you want to be, and that's very inspiring. Given how divided this country is right now, do you think that what you're doing helps or hinders the country? Um, I don't know. Because sometimes I'm like, isn't it great that we're here so that somebody sees drag and goes, that speaks to me. That doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna run to a voting booth or be a better person. Like, I guess the older I get, the more I'm like, well, I know why I started drag. 
And then the more, I guess, influence you get with fame, the more you're like, well, what's the responsibility and how far does it go? And for me, I'm a little short-sighted in that I want to encourage people to be good to each other and I just want to do a drag show. Like, that's it. I just want to get a little drunk. <laughs> like, drag queens, we're not curing cancer, you know. Still, Trixie hasn't backed down from talking about issues that matter. Trixie and her collaborator, Katya, have figured out how to turn hot button issues into comedy gold. That I'm from Wisconsin, bitch. Be happy the gang's all here. The Trixie and Katya show a couple of years ago was cancelled at some point because, in part because, you know, Katya was dealing with her own issues. How common are mental health struggles within the drag community? When Moving Parts came out, a lot of people were asking, you know, questions about, like, how do you feel including all that content about mental health and drug use and depression? The wretched and pervasive stigmatization of mental illness in America. I think that since gay people are X amount of times more likely to struggle with depression and drugs and mental illness, not talking about it is part of the problem. And like, it was the Trixie and Katya show, so given that it had a short lifespan because Katya has, you know, some of her own demons, I love working with her. And so at the time it was like, well, I mean, I was disappointed. I remember the day we kind of like closed the show and I knew it wasn't gonna get renewed, I came home and cried so hard. Cause you have to imagine, I was like flipping on cable, seeing a show with my first name in it, like what? But then again, there's so many great shows who were canceled for, you know, less. Everybody in the beginning was like, just be grateful you have one season and that made it easy. What about the other version of you then? Like when you're not in drag, do you feel, do you like that version of yourself? Do you feel comfortable with that version of yourself? Like, I know I'm not disgusting, but I know I'm not super hot and I'm kind of at peace with that. There was this article that described me out of drag as an unprepossessing bald man from Wisconsin. Oh, I saw and that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that is it though. And honestly, I think it's good that I look normal or borderline like awful out of drag because it's a little more like the audience knows that I don't, I'm not this tall and powerful and beautiful all the time. If you're a real famous, beautiful person, everywhere you go, people treat you special. When I'm not in drag, nobody treats me special, you know? And oh my God, it was just yesterday when drag queens were not cool and even the gay boys at the gay bar didn't want to talk to us. We were not cool for a very long time. Is it a positive thing? Like, does it get you more swipes on Tinder? I think it's changed. You have to think like 10 years ago, telling someone you did drag means like they're gonna run for the hills. And now it's like telling someone you go to like a yoga class. Like it's not even a big deal. But and I used like, to say on Tinder, I used to say I was a comedian and a guitar collector, which wasn't a lie. I just didn't say like I do it in a wig. Right. Yeah, I can imagine matching with a fan is also not ideal. Yeah, but like, let's say you're in a TV show. In your Tinder bio, do you feel the need to disclose the character you're playing? Like, it is sort of, I guess, a lifestyle thing, but like my boyfriend, he loves all queer expressions of any kind, and he loves reality TV. So for me to be, I always make fun of him because I'm like, you love reality TV so much, you stalked me, <laughs> you know, but. But was he a fan before he met you? He, uh, he wasn't a fan, like he'd seen drag before, Drag Race. And on our first date, I was maybe like two drinks in and I was like, I have to be honest, I do drag for a living. I play this character, Trixie Mattel. And he goes, I knew who you were, you just seemed like you didn't want to say it. So I was waiting for you to like say it your own way. How considerate. I know, and it kind of made me feel stupid. Like at the time I was like, you're 27 years old and you're still having a hard time being honest about what you do for a living. Like you want the world to accept drag, but you can't even like on a Tinder date be upfront about it. Why is that? 10 years ago, drag was not cool to a lot of people. And in a world where people commodify masculinity, when you dress as a woman, to a lot of people, you're submitting all of that. You're, you know, giving it up. Do you think in the future there will be more gender fluidity? Uh, yeah, I mean, look at the, like, the 18-year-olds now. Like, the generation coming after us, being gay is not even interesting to them. Coming out's not even, like, a drama. And that makes me happy. It's just like, let people be themselves. We're all in some form of drag. If you weren't in this interview, what would you be wearing? Oh man, 
sweatpants. She's like gowns. <laughs> Full updo and gowns. Yeah, sweatpants. Just pure silk kimonos. So no sounds, sweatpants, always. It sounds kind of cornball, but like we're all naked and the rest is dressing up. I mean, that's it. 